Um, it's not as easy. I know what it is. Um, but let's hope that this will turn into um, um, a good start for the week, right? So very quickly on myself, um, my name is Tzlil Shushan, and I'm currently a postdoc researcher in University of Wollongong in Sydney, Australia. And today I'm going to present some parts of my PhD work um, on submaximal fitness tests in team sport. Um, as Marco mentioned, I'm aiming for approximately 35 minutes, and hopefully then we'll have some enhanceful discussion, and um, Q&A would be great as well. All right, so let's go ahead. Um, I believe that the first question we should ask ourselves is why we should bother about testing or assessing our athletes? Well, we might all agree that there are several important reasons for that. So first, it helps us to apply an objective training management that helps us to decide when we can push our athletes a little bit more and when we need to pull back. We can also establish benchmark for our athletes and compare an individual to the team or the world team to any norms or standards. It also assists to prescribe training to the individual athlete, for example, using maximal aerobic speed tests um, for high intensity interval training prescriptions. And finally, and some would argue that the most important, um, it provides us the ability to track acute and chronic training effect, and by then enhance the reflection and adjustment to the training program. Um, the traditional approach to testing, especially in high performance sport, when competition schedule are very busy and tests are typically um, scheduled in the beginning of the preseason, maybe just again in the in season. And if we are lucky enough, we have the ability to get one or two more assessments throughout the year. Um, However, the problem with this approach is that we as coaches get very limited information about our athletes and their physiological or physical state, and therefore cannot really enjoy, if you want, from the advantages of testing. To address these limitations, the concept of embedded testing or invisible monitoring has become quite popular in team sport. And these two are typically refer to ongoing assessments of performance and physiology, perform as frequently as possible while being minimally invasive to both the athletes and the training program. Um, this approach is more aligned to what we call an agile approach to testing, where we frequently evaluate athletes' physiological state using assessments that are more pragmatic or feasible to perform. One of the closest approaches to invisible monitoring involves the use of submaximal fitness tests. I believe that the term submaximal fitness tests might be new for some of you. So let's try first understand what this assessment mean and constitute. In our recent review, we try to provide a coherent definition for submaximal fitness tests. And this include um, a short exercise bout undertaken at a standardized intensity that is intended to be non-exhausting and performed with the purpose of inferring an athlete's physiological state through the monitoring of relevant outcome measures. So let's start with the exercise first. When you basically dive into the research, specifically in team sport, you'll probably find enormous amount of different submax protocols. But in, mo in most cases, they fall into five different categories that are based on the exercise regimen, whereas the um, activity throughout the assessment is continuous or intermittent um, by nature. And the second level is um, relating to the intensity profile throughout the activity, whether it remains fixed, it follows an incremental pattern or a variable pattern and sometimes even randomly variable. Um, in this figure, you can see the frequency of categories in both research and practice. It is quite clear that the protocols used in both settings are pretty comparable. And basically, the majority of researchers and practitioners are opting for using continuous fixed protocols in green. And these are typically administered using track or shuttle runs at fixed intensity for um, three to five minutes usually, 
or alternatively, um, intermittent incremental protocols in red. And these are essentially um, shorter versions of established field pace assessment, such as the 3015 intermittent fitness tests. Um, as you recall from the definition for, of submaximal fitness tests, to infer on the physiological state of the athletes, we can monitor various responses or outcome measures that can be collected during or immediately following the assessment. Generally, there are three main types of outcome measures, and these are divided into cardiorespiratory metabolic, subjective, and mechanical. Cardiorespiratory metabolic measures are commonly involve heart rate derived indices, such as exercise heart rate throughout or heart rate recovery following the activity. Subjective outcome measure um, mainly include variations of ratings of perceived exertion. And mechanical outcome measures are either locomotor output, such as the total distance or the distance covered in certain speed threshold, or data derived from energial measurement units or IMUs, such as accelerometry load, or stride kinematic related variables, such as um, ground contact time, flight time, stride length, etc. Um, as part of the process for trying to understand the practical application of applications of submaximal fitness test in team sport, um, we surveyed 66 team sport practitioners that um, used or have used at that time um, submaximal fitness test as part of their monitoring um, tools. And most of them were actually coming from um, high performance organization um, such as um, um, organization competing in international competitions. In the following figure, for example, you can see the distribution of the three response type across all five different categories, and this is from A to B. And you can also see the individual outcome measures or variables that are um, uh, within each response type, and this is from B to C. If you look on the most right, you can basically notice that heart rate derived indices um, uh, get the widest portion of or comparing to all other variables. And indeed, approximately 80% of practitioners reporting using exercise heart rate as their main outcome measure. And then approximately half of this group also reported collecting heart rate recovery alongside exercise heart rate. Um, when thinking on the physiological underlying mechanisms, the use of exercise heart rate makes sense. From basic exercise physiology principles, we know that heart rate share a strong linear relationship with the oxygen demands during a range of submaximal steady state exercises, and thereby exercise heart rate can theoretically provide a valid proxy measure of within athlete or within individual exercise intensity. So by standardizing the external stimulus and evaluating the changes, the changes in heart rate response, we can potentially infer on um, an athlete's cardiorespiratory fitness. To visually represent this concept, um, this graph illustrates heart rate response to a three minutes continuous fixed protocol at a mean velocity of 11 kilometers per hour. And the X axis represents the time in second while the y-axis represents heart rate response expressed as percentages of heart rate max. And as you can see that after approximately two to two and a half minutes, heart rate reach uh, a more steady state response. And then um, uh, to obtain the most accurate value and theoretically avoid um, uh, outliers from um, or potential data outliers, exercise heart rate is typically calculated as the mean heart rate response during the last 30 and up to 60 seconds of the test. All right, so similar to any load or response measure we collect, it is essential to understand its measurement properties. In the context of submaximal fitness tests, gaining insight into the reliability of exercise heart rate will allow us to know its expected variability and thereby assist in understanding the magnitude of meaningful changes. Additionally, 
to understand better the validity of exercise heart rate as a proxy marker of athletes' cardiorespiratory fitness, we should evaluate the correlation between the two variables. And to answer these questions, um, uh, we conducted a um, systematic review and meta-analysis on exercise heart rate measurement properties. And the first thing we concluded is that exercise heart rate is highly reliable. Its typical error of measurement, or in other words, the expected variability in heart rate across similar assessment at the same conditions, is about 1.6 percent point. To interpret this with an athlete, for example, who showed an exercise heart rate of 85% of heart rate max at baseline, the expected variability within this error is somewhere between 83.5 to 86.5% of heart rate maximum. Um, here we also constructed what's called the prediction intervals for the analysis. And these are basically convey the um, expected range of typical error in any future practices or individual studies. And we observe a range between 0.9 to 3% points. And we also implemented the meta regression analysis to evaluate the possible effects of different modifying factors. For example, the duration of the assessment, the intensity of the assessment, or any athlete um, related characteristics such as the age or the performance level. Um, overall, we found negligible changes in typical error when considering all modifying factors. And here, for example, when considering exercise intensity of the assessment or the x-axis, and this is expressed as percentages of heart rate max, we can see that typical error seem to be lower, improve at lower intensities versus higher intensities. However, um, the differences were um, non-significant and also impractical. And to interpret this, for every 5% point increase in um, exercise intensity, for example, from 80 to 85, the expected change in typical error is 0.09% point, where um, we consider it very unreasonable to be practical um, in practice. Regarding validity, um, here you can see the force plot for studies examining the relationship between exercise heart rate during submax tests and a criterion measure of cardiorespiratory fitness. As typically done in team sports, um, these studies mainly included the final distance or velocity in field-based assessment, such as the Euro intermittent recovery test, um, mostly level one, and the 30-15 intermittent um, fitness test. Overall, um, we found a large inversely relationship between the two variables. And basically, this means that an athlete who exhibit a lower exercise heart rate during the submax test, he or she are also expected to achieve higher performance results in the maximal cardio um, respiratory fitness test. Similar as before, we constructed um, prediction intervals, and they basically suggested that future studies can or practices can expect um, a range between moderate and up to very large um, relationship magnitudes. Also for this analysis, um, the moderating factors or modifying factors were trivial. Um, and again, for exercise intensity again, you can see that the relationship between the two variables um, seem to increase at higher, below, at higher intensities versus lower intensities. But if we consider, for example, um, an increase in intensity of 5% point of um, um, heart rate max, we expect changes in correlation of 0.03 correlation units. And again, this is something that is very unreasonable to consider meaningful. All right. Um, I think that one important thing to remember that the results from the meta-analysis of validity provide us with a solid foundation for using exercise heart rate to compare between individuals, but it does not necessarily reflect the within individual or within athlete changes in cardiorespiratory fitness. Another important thing to highlight is that only a few studies, I think only one or two of them, um, actually use a gold standard measure of cardiorespiratory fitness, like oxygen uptake collected in laboratory conditions, 
or the derivative of maximal aerobic speed from oxygen kinetics. And for these reasons, uh, we decided to examine whether exercise heart rate can provide us a valid marker of routine athlete changes in cardio respiratory fitness, while also conducting these assessments in both laboratory and field settings. So the following data is currently unpublished and hopefully to be submitted soon. Um, but the current figure illustrates the changes in exercise heart rate during submaximal fitness tests on the x-axis versus changes in cardiorespiratory measures um, collected in the lab. And on the left, you can see maximal oxygen uptake and on the right, maximal aerobic speed. And these tests were conducted before and after seven weeks preseason of football. Um, if you want the real football, soccer um, um, training. So you probably noticed that there are three different lines um, representing different um, uh, colors. And these are basically the different submaximal protocols that we had. We had a laboratory protocol in blue that was um, uh, administered just before the maximal test in the lab. And we did have also um, two different um, submaximal protocols that were conducted weekly across the seven weeks. And these are represented in green and in red and they actually had different exercise intensities. Um, if you look on the figures, you can see that all the three regression lines follow a similar uh, pattern, indicating a very large relationship between the within athlete changes in exercise heart rate and changes in criterion measure of cardiorespiratory fitness. So uh, basically the results suggest that exercise heart rate um, during field-based submaximal fitness tests can be used to monitor with inactive changes in cardiorespiratory fitness. And this is at least in a magnitude that is comparable to um, submaximal protocols that were conducted in a more um, standardized conditions, such as laboratory testing. All right. Um, I think that now we move to discuss a little bit about acute or transient training effect with heart rate derived indices. Um, generally speaking, there is a lack of consensus regarding the usefulness of exercise heart rate or heart rate recovery from the submax test to draw any inferences about transient training effects or fatigue, if you want. Um, the underlying mechanisms supporting these notions are a bit more complex and are related to feedback from central places such as the cardiac control center and ventrolateral medulla. Or afferent feedback from peripheral um, places or the muscles themselves. As part of this complexity of the physiological mechanisms, we know that variations in heart rate derived indices can, be, can go to basically both directions with increased training stress. For example, um, uh, we know that training or we assume that training induced fatigue can result in a greater muscle activation for the same external standardized intensity, which will yield to increase oxygen demand. And because the linear relationship between the two, um, therefore heart rate response supposed to increase. But on the other hand, um, training induced fatigue can influence the balance between the cardiac um, sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system, and also increase blood plasma volume that we know that um, both of them can promote reductions in exercise heart rate, for example. Let's look at this recent study as an example. Here, the authors observed that increased training load three days preceding to the submax test protocol elicit a lower heart rate response. Um, and we can see it for both external training load using high speed running and internal training load using training impulse. But we can also see that um, the magnitude of correlation was higher to internal training load versus the external training load, which theoretically makes sense um, if we assume that cardiovascular load is supposed to be related more to cardiovascular response, right? Um, but again, um, a wider examination of the research, research um, specifically in team sports, revealed conflicting results, and generally the evidence in team sports athletes is very weak. Um, therefore, um, one of the main areas for future studies is looking at these premises 
with a view of understanding the sensitivity of RKDR indexes to negative transient training effects. Um, another interesting area that has received an increased attention from practitioners is the efficacy of intermittent variable submax protocols as alternatives to the more generic protocols like continuous fixed runs. As a reminder, um, intermittent variable protocols are featured in variable locomotor demands and are typically administered in the form of um, standardized training drills, such as one-sided game. But um, a key consideration with this protocol is the substantial variability in locomotor outputs during the drills, which can impact heart rate response and theoretically or potentially can compromise the quality of the collected data. Um, for example, in a recent study, um, in a recent meta-analysis that we conducted together with Marco and, and Antonio, um, uh, we we found that the variability in high-speed running during the side, the different formats of sided games um, is quite huge and can reach coefficients of variation of more than 100%. And this basically means that the same athletes can be exposed to double the times the locomotor demands exactly in the same dreams, in the same conditions. And another thing that we probably want to remember that um, um, drills like small-sided games um, create more frequent player interaction and contact, and we know that this may introduce um, additional noise to heart rate races. For example, um, we know from colleagues that are working in um, Australian football or um, rugby that the, the amount of contact creates lots of lots of noise um, during such drills. Um, a powerful solution for coping with this previous limitation involved the adoption of standardized training drills that induce or potentially induce less variability in locomotor demands, such as passing training drills. And second is to apply a bit more advanced analytical approaches for controlling the changes in locomotor output across the assessments. Um, let's look at one example in football. And here, um, to be very honest, I was lucky enough that the head coach decided to run the same passing drill immediately following the submax test that we had anyway. And this um, uh, were administer was administered in the beginning of the session um, across a 50 meter shuttle runs for two minutes at a mean velocity of 12 kilometers per hour. Um, and then the first technical tactical drill um, included um, two sets of four minutes of y shape passing drill, which I believe that most of you are familiar with. Um, I consider only the first set, the first four minutes, and we had two different formations, and in each formation we had eight players, so theoretically um, 16 players are monitored at the same time, but the data that I'm going to show is from 20 players. So, um, here you can also see an example of how the GPS traces look like. And this is for the continuous fix. We see the shuttle pattern here, which is more consistent. This is something that is a bit more variable or chaotic during the standardized passing drill. Um, my initial analysis involved exploring within athlete correlations between exercise heart rate for the continuous fix protocol on the x-axis. And this was calculated as the mean heart rate response um, across the last 30 seconds of the assessment. And this was versus the row values and calculated as the mean heart rate response during the entire y shape um, four minutes passing drill. And you can see that within athlete correlations were um, uh, 0.6, which convey um, a large relationship, and the 90% confidence interval convey between moderate, uh, moderate to very large relationship. And this is quite a positive start for us um, because I subsequently um, performed a mixed effect model to control for external loads. And this includes variables um, of total distance, um, high speed running and player load. And by doing so, you basically aim to account for any changes in locomotor output. So the model assumes that um, these locomotor outputs were the same across all the drills. And by that, it provides you an adjusted 
or predicted heart rate response um, um, uh, uh, to your data set. And when I ran the correlations again, you can see that it's a little bit more tight and, and look much more firm. Um, uh, we found a substantial improvement in within atlet correlation um, of, um, of 0 0.82 and the 95, 90% confidence interval suggesting um, very large relationships. And again, um, the x-axis include the exact same values from the continuous fixed protocols, while the y-axis rather than have the mean over the four minutes, um, they are also including the adjusted exercise heart rate response, assuming that the external loads were controlled. And this preliminary finding um, indicate that the Y-shaped passing drill can provide similar in insight or comparable insights as continuous fixed submax protocols. But um, I think that the question of whether we can confidently use this as a standalone alternative monitoring tool is still far and needed to be confirmed with larger data sets and individuals. All right, um, for the last five to seven minutes, I would love to shift the focus a little bit and discuss on the use of submaximal fitness tests as markers of neuromuscular function. So assessing neuromuscular function or fatigue is a key um, or, or a very common issue in professional sport, probably because it is believed to provide us uh, better insights into um, lower limb um, neuromuscular status and by that mitigating the risk of lower limb injuries. Um, and these assessments are profoundly monitored using isolated um, tests of jumps or strength, such as isometric strength, and sometimes additionally to um, what we call athlete reported outcome measures, including wellness questionnaires and well-being markers. But as per the maximal cardio respiratory fitness assessment, jumps and strength assessment required isolated um, testing procedure from the training session. They have many contextual and individual elements that can influence data inferences, but to be honest, this is with any outcome measure that we collect, um, but they also may be less specific to running-based activities. For example, it may be uh, more specific to assess running-based activities, um, specifically in team sport, while the athletes are running. Um, although the research encompassing the assessment of lower limb neuromuscular status through submaximal fitness test assessment is not as large and quite young, um, the studies use mechanical outcome measures derived from inertial measurement units, or IMUs, have shown some promising results. However, um, currently there is a quite large diversity in submax test protocols. Their programming variables, the IMU uh, body segment or location, the analytical approaches um, used to obtain or establish outcome measures, and subsequently, lots of lots of variables that can theoretically can be analyzed. Um, so to improve insight um, on these questions, we conducted a study that aimed to explore these differences. And this was actually um, accepted for publication very recently and hopefully will be online soon. So um, in this study, we examined the reliability of mechanical outcome measures across different submax protocols. And we had two different continuous um, um, protocols in a low intensity, and you can see it on the green shaded area. Then um, with a higher intensity in the yellow shaded area, and these were followed by four runs, or you can call it intermittent fixed protocol, um, including four runs at a mean velocity of 18 kilometers per hour. And you basically run um, 50 meters for 10 seconds and then rest um, for 20 seconds and do it four times. Um, and we also use um, both IMUs between the scapula using catapults and I use um, or foot mounted I use using a player maker and these two technology provided us with a large array of outcome measures. And finally, um, we also analyze the data using different analytical approaches. For example, um, this figure um, illustrate only one of the 18 kilometers um, per hour 
um, intermittent trans. And we analyze the data or apart from analyzing the data using the entire run, as indicated by the blue line for 10 seconds, we also employed some analytical approaches to um, dictate or to denote the constant or plateau phase uh, of the run. And this is indicated by the pink um, shaded area. So very briefly, um, the main results indicated the highest reliability for the vertical accelerometer magnitude derived from scapular mounted IMUs, and this was um, player load vertical, and also for contact time derived from the foot mounted IMUs, and this was with player maker. And generally, um, these two were quite consistent across submax test protocols and analytical approaches. And therefore, um, these are the ones that we recommend to have more attention when using mechanical outcome, uh, um, outcome measures, um, at least from um, uh, this reliability study. All right, um, let's try um, to get or to wrap up really quickly with some take home messages. So, submaximal fitness tests are a pragmatic alternative to assess um, our athletes in a short, time efficient, and minimally fatiguing approach. Exercise heart rate is a valid proxy of athlete's cardiorespiratory fitness level and adaptive response, and this is between individual and within individual, basically. Um, heart rate derived indexed should be monitored using continuous fixed protocols at fixed intensity, lasting to three to four minutes, with exercise heart rate calculated as the mean heart rate during the last 30 to 60 seconds of the test. Generally, um, four to 5% point changes in exercise heart rate, for example, from 88% to 84, at baseline to 84% um, of heart rate maximums should be considered as meaningful cardiorespiratory training effects. Intermittent variables protocol, um, such as passing drill, can be useful for monitoring athlete physiological state. Um, again, um, we need larger scale studies and also um, something that I've started doing a little bit is to use um, both of them, uh, the continuous fix as a more generic versus the passing wheel as a more specific um, uh, assessment. And finally, or oh, almost finally, heart rate derived indices can respond in a positive direction to increase training load. And therefore, um, they should be interpreted while reflecting on the overall context of the training program. And this should include uh, training phase, the periodization, and the day-to-day -day monitoring. And finally, uh, mechanical responses derived from IMUs are promising for evaluating neuromuscular fatigue and efficiency, and mainly um, vertical magnitude accelerometer from scapula-mounted um, IMUs and contact time from foot-mounted IMUs. Um, they exhibit higher reliability, and we know that from at least for the scapula mounted IMUs, um, they have um, the vertical accelerometer has um, better sensitivity. All right, thank you so much. Um, I believe... Thank you very much, Phil, yes. for uh, your presentation. It's, uh, it's been really a pleasure to listen to you. So uh, I would like to open the floor for questions.